this morning with each other and God and giving him all the glory and we are in the middle of this sermon series about um, the Lord's Prayer and it is just so nice to go into the spirit and to seek God's comfort and wisdom and guidance through prayer and it's just so nice to sit and focus on this because we all need more of it because it changes our heart to see things the way he wants us to see them. And so when we spend that time with him, there is nothing that is better than that time spent. Nothing better than to spend time with our God. So we're going to see graves in the gardens because he makes miracles happen every day.
so appropriate this morning because he is the perfect God and none of us are. So this song is our reminder to surrender and to be willing to accept the love and the guidance that he provides us through our prayer. Even when we don't feel like he's listening, even when we don't feel like we've been seen or heard, he has us through everything. He will never let us down. Sing this song, please, to our King of Kings. great morning to come together and hear incredible music. Thank you all so much. 
We are so blessed every single week through our musicians and our singers. Thank you all. I want to uh, welcome you to worship here at St. Luke's. And if you have not done so, please take just a moment and let us know that you're worshiping with us by texting the word guest, or if you're a member, texting the word member to 405-351-4001. It lets us know that you're worshiping with us this morning, either in person or online. Now, it's that same phone number you can use to text any prayer requests to. We take those very seriously and we pray over those prayer concerns at every staff meeting and we have a prayer team that continually lifts them up for prayer. This morning I bring to you uh, four families who are in need of your prayers. Please remember David and Lori Jackson and Rachel and Joel Flaggart at the death of David's mother and Rachel's grandmother, Mary Lou. We also want to remember the friends and family of Don Kincaid who passed away. And please remember the friends and family of Jim Venable who passed away earlier this week. We also want to remember Dan and Phyllis Larson and their friends and family at the death of Dan's mother, Ruth Chapman. I hope that you will remember these families in your prayers, not just today, but for the weeks and months to come. Next Sunday, we will have Membership Sunday here at our campus. And if you're in person next Sunday and you are interested in finding out more about St. Luke's and what it means to be a member, after the worship service, you can swing by the bookstore, Threefold Bookstore, and there will be a clergy person there to answer any questions you have or to receive you into membership. If you're watching online next week and you're interested in becoming a member of St. Luke's, you can simply text the word JOIN to 405-351-4001 and someone will get in contact with you to arrange uh, either online or in person to answer any questions you have and receive you into membership. Today is Father's Day and so for all the men who are here, I just want to say Happy Father's Day. We have a special gift for you after the service. We have Pops for Pop. And so uh, you can get those and a Pop koozie out in the narthex when you leave. And this isn't just for fathers. We all know men in our lives who have made a difference and impact on our lives. So any man, after the worship service, you can go by and pick up a a bottle of pop and your koozie to go along with it. And we just want to thank you for all the ways that you make a difference in our lives and in this world. And finally, you can be a part of the ministries of St. Luke's by giving to the church. Your gifts are an act of worship, an expression of gratitude to God for all that God has done in our lives. But it's also a way that you can make a difference in the world because your gifts to the church go to support our television and online ministries, all of our worship services, all of our programming for children and youth, and all of the missions that we're a part of. So you can give today by texting uh, the letters STL to 73256. And your gift will go and make a difference. If you're here in person, there are offering boxes out in the narthex and if you're online you can always go to the website and give uh, accordingly we want to continue in our time of worship with that time of gratitude and expression of love toward god and so let us all join together in an attitude of prayer almighty god we thank you for all the ways that you bless our lives we thank you that we can come together and know your love for us and that you call us to share that love with others. Be with those who are hurting because of loss, the families that we've lifted up, and anyone and everyone here and online who is hurting because of struggles in their lives. Remind them of your presence for them. Help them to seek out and take refuge in your strength. Lord, we pray that you would use us in this world, that we would be generous in our love 
and we would show the patience that you have so often shown to us. Use us to be a reflection of Christ's love and mercy to the world. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much. 
Will you please stand for the reading of the word? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Will you please be seated? Prayer is a time to connect to the heart of God. God knows our needs before we ask, but we are still encouraged to ask. Conversation with God is to change our hearts rather than try to change God's mind. We can learn a lot by looking at the way that Jesus prayed. He taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, Father's Day has become an even more special holiday to me over these last several years, as this year is my third year to be celebrating Father's Day as a father. Many of you may know or have heard me talk about my daughter, Lucy. She's a little over two years old now, and she is one of the greatest joys of my life. We have so much fun together. She has got this point now where she's, uh, she's got uh, full of personality, full of life. She loves to laugh and have fun and play. And we just have such a good time together. You know, I remember when Lucy was about to be born, and I received all kinds of advice from people. And I really cherished the advice that I got. Be able, being able to hear from those who had already experienced parenthood, those who had walked that journey of fatherhood, it really meant a lot to me to be able to hear advice from others of what to expect and what to look out for. You know, one of the things that I kept hearing over and over again from people is, it flies by so fast. The time just goes so quickly. You know, I knew that on an intellectual level. I had experienced some of that in my own life personally. But I knew that as I kept hearing this over and over again, there really was truth to it. But what I've come to learn is it's one thing to know that intellectually. It's another thing to experience the time flying by. These last two plus years really have flown by. It seems like it was just yesterday I remember bringing her home from the hospital and I remember from that very first night bringing her home that I wanted to establish a, a tradition, a ritual that we could do every night to end our day right before bedtime. Something that we would be able to do as she grows older, something that would help us to end our day well. And so from that very first night that we brought her home from the hospital, we ended our day by sitting down in her nursery in her chair, and I was holding her as she was swaddled up, and we read a book together. And after we read a bedtime story, then... I offered a prayer, and I closed that prayer by saying the Lord's Prayer. It's how I've put her to bed every single night that, for the last two plus years now, by reading a book, by saying a prayer, and by ending with the Lord's Prayer. You know, when we first started that on that very first night, of course, she had no idea what prayer was. She didn't know what words I was saying or what any of it meant. She didn't know much of anything at that point. Two years later now, she understands that it's time to pray before we go to bed. And I'm not sure she still quite, under, quite understands all of the mechanics of prayer. I'm not sure I understand all of the mechanics of prayer. But she knows that before we go to bed that I'll say it's time to pray. And she'll put her hands together and she'll close her eyes and she'll lean her head into me and she'll stay silent while I pray. And then I'll always close with the Lord's Prayer. And as I'm closing, I'll say, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And then right there at bedtime in her little quiet whisper, she'll say with me, Amen. And then she'll get up from her chair and go get ready to get into bed. You know, two years later, she still doesn't know what all the words mean. She can't recite the Lord's Prayer with me. But I know before too much longer, time will continue to fly and she will start saying the words with me. But you know, what, the, what I've come to understand is that we all have memorized this Lord's Prayer because we know that there's something special about it. There's something meaningful and spiritual about the Lord's Prayer. So we've memorized these words and we come together every week as a family of faith and we recite these words. But sometimes what I find is if we're not careful, it just becomes ritual. It becomes a habit that we do and we don't really take the time to think about what these words mean for our lives. 
That's why I think it's so important that we're going through the sermon series right now. The prayer he taught us. It's over these uh, several weeks here, we're going to be looking at the Lord's Prayer and, and what Jesus was trying to teach us about prayer and about life and about who we're called to be as disciples of Christ. As we're going through this prayer, we're going line by line. And today I wanted to look at these two lines. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. These are two of the most powerful lines, I think, in the entire prayer. Because these two lines remind us that prayer isn't just about offering a wish list to God, asking God to do certain things for us. Well, I think these two lines of the prayer remind us that prayer is also about changing our hearts calling us into action in the world. You know, the Lord's Prayer can be found in the Scriptures in two different places in the Gospels. You can find it in Luke chapter 11. There it's kind of a shorter, pared-down version of the Lord's Prayer than what we pray today. But you can find a more full version in Matthew chapter 6, where we're reading from our Scripture today. And in Matthew chapter 6, it's part of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' most extensive teaching in the Gospels. It's really all about the Christian life, what it means to live as people of faith. And throughout the Sermon on the Mount, he addresses all kinds of different topics about everyday life. But if you look at Matthew chapters 5 through 7, the very center of the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15. It's the Lord's Prayer. I don't think it was an accident that Jesus included the Lord's Prayer as the very center of his Sermon on the Mount. And I don't think it's an accident that Matthew wrote it that way. It was to say that not only is the Lord's Prayer the structural center of the Sermon on the Mount, but it's also the theological center. That as Jesus is talking about the Christian life, what it means to live as people of faith, the very heart of it is a life of prayer. That as we live out our faith journey... Prayer is an essential part of who we are. And when you look at the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, verses 5 through 15, the very center of that is verse 10, our verse for today. It's as if to say that Jesus was trying to teach his disciples that if you want to know what it means to live the Christian life, if you want to know what it means to live a faith journey, it centers around this line of this prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's not just a wish list that we're offering to God, but I believe it's a call for us to open our hearts so that we can participate in God's will, bringing God's will to earth just as it is in heaven and bringing about God's glimpses of God's kingdom here on earth. We have an opportunity to participate with what God is doing in our world. So as we continue our sermon series this morning, I want to look at these two statements. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And I want to start by looking at that second statement. Thy will be done. You know, the idea of God's will is a, it's a big topic. It's something that has lots of ramifications for our lives and our world. Sometimes it's difficult for us to understand what is God's will. How can we know God's will? What does it mean to do God's will? You know, sometimes when we talk about prayer and we talk about God's will, we can, we can use it in somewhat humorous and lighthearted ways. For example, how often have we heard people make comments about it being God's will for their favorite sports team to win a game? Or how often have we heard people talk about it being God's will for their favorite player to do well? You know, sometimes we're joking when we say that. But here in Oklahoma, we do take our sports pretty seriously, so I'm not sure all the time that it's a joke but it becomes a little bit more serious when we start hearing these same comments and phrases being used in politics. People believing that it's God's will that their candidate or their party wins an election or that a certain vote goes a certain way and that that is God's will for our world. It becomes a little bit more serious when we hear it used in these terms. It becomes even more serious whenever we, we find that it takes a personal effect on our lives whenever the idea of God's will hits home with us and, and we find ourselves in those dark moments of life, moments where we hear words like, you have cancer, or your loved one didn't make it. How do we understand God's will in those kind of moments? 
what is God's will in these different circumstances? You know, one of the books that I read early on in my ministry that really helped me wrestle with this theology around the idea of God's will was a book that was written nearly 80 years ago now by a Methodist minister named Leslie Weatherhead. Leslie Weatherhead was a minister over in London during the time of World War II. You could imagine what difficult and dark times those were in London. When constant air raids happening by the Germans, the city was getting bombed night after night. People were facing food shortages and supply issues. Young men were going off to war and too many of them weren't returning back home. It was a time of economic turmoil and uncertainty. Oh, the people of London were wrestling with this idea of God's will. Leslie Weatherhead was preaching at the city temple there in London. And so he decided in 1944 to preach a sermon series called The Will of God. It was a five-week sermon series that he preached. And at the end of those five weeks, it had gone over so well that, that so many people were asking him for copies of this sermon that he decided to just take them and put them all together and publish it as a book called The Will of God. For nearly 80 years now, it's become one of the classic theological books helping us to wrestle with the idea of God's will. And in his book, The Will of God, Leslie Weatherhead starts off by telling a story and talking about his understanding of God's will. And I want to read you what he said. My boy was killed 10 days ago in one of the raids on Berlin, said a woman. But I'm trying to bow to the inscrutable will of God. But was that the will of God? I should have said it was the will of the enemy, of Hitler, if you like, of the evil forces we were fighting. Are they then the same thing? Here is a mother wringing her hands and weeping in anguish because her baby is dead. Her minister stands by her longing to comfort her. But though his presence and prayers may offer consolation, he knows only too well that when the storm is raging, it is too late to talk about the anchor that should have been put down before the storm began. What I mean is that it is so important that we should try to think clearly before disaster falls upon us. If we do, then in spite of all our grief, we have a philosophy of life that steadies us as an anchor steadies a ship. If we do not, the storm is so furious that little can be done until it has abated. We come together as a family of faith every week and we recite this prayer. And we say these words, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And yet how often do we really stop to contemplate to think about what God's will is for our lives and for our world? How often do we intentionally stop to think about what God is asking from us on a daily basis? Well, sometimes we wait until we find ourselves in the midst of those dark nights to talk about God's will. But as Leslie Weatherhead pointed out, when we find ourselves in the midst of the storm, it's too late. The time to contemplate about our theology and to think about God's will is now, before the storm comes. So that when those dark nights come in life, we already have an anchor that will hold us steady. You know, as he preached this sermon series and as he talked about God's will, he identified what he called three different types of God's will. It's what he called God's intentional will, God's circumstantial will, and God's ultimate will. And he defined these by saying that God's intentional will is what God intended from the very beginning of creation, for all of creation. It was God's original intentions before sin got in the way. But he said, we know that because of God's love for us, we've been given free will. We have choices to make in life. And sometimes we have used that freedom of choice to choose not to love. And our world and our lives at times have become broken. There's been hurt and violence and injustice. And so we find ourselves in circumstances that weren't what God originally intended. And so he says that's when God's circumstantial will comes in. That when we find ourselves in that place where we are broken, where we're in that dark night, that God comes to meet us in the midst of those circumstances. That we don't have to try to find our, ourselves back to God's original intentions before we can find God's will. He says, no, God comes to us in the midst of those circumstances and leads us forward from there. That's God's circumstantial will. It wasn't what God originally intended, but in the midst of these circumstances... How can we move forward from here? And then there's what he calls God's ultimate will. He says this is God's ultimate goals, ultimate purposes that will be accomplished, not just in spite of sin and brokenness, 
But sometimes God is able to even work through the sin and darkness to bring about these goals and purposes. You know, I was thinking about this so much over these last couple of weeks. You may know that this last week, about 75 of us from St. Luke's just returned home from a spiritual pilgrimage. We went over to Italy and Austria and Germany, and we we went to go learn all about the history of the church and to travel in the footsteps of many of the saints of the church, learning about their lives and their ministry and what they did to impact the church and the world still today. We went ultimately and we ended up in Oberammergau, Germany, where we got to witness the Passion Play, this incredible play that's put on once every 10 years since the 1600s, the time of the Black Plague. It was an incredible pilgrimage, and we're going to be sharing more about that with you here over the next several weeks. But as I was reflecting on our trip and thinking about this idea of God's will, I just was thinking about in broad terms what we saw and experienced. You know, along the way, as we traveled through Rome and Florence and Venice and some of these incredible cities, we got to see some beautiful cathedrals and basilicas, some amazing churches that have been built over time. And I was struck by their beauty, by the grandeur of it all and how magnificent they were. And yet I also had this mixture of emotions as we were leaving some of them because I couldn't help but also think about how some of them had been built. Remember, it was back in the 1600s that St. Peter's Basilica was built. And it was funded in large part by the sale of indulgences. You remember that indulgences, selling indulgences, was a practice that was taking place back in the church in the, the 15th and 16th centuries. It was the idea that if you had committed a sin that you could receive forgiveness for your sins if you paid a certain amount to the church. So it didn't matter what you did. If you paid enough, you were forgiven, and life was good, and you were guaranteed eternal life. That was the theology that started to take shape. It was a good, it was a good situation for those who were wealthy, those who had the money. They could go do whatever they wanted. But it wasn't so good for the poor. Then this theology continued to develop to a point where they said, well, it's not just paying for yourself and your own sins, but you could actually pay for the sins of your loved ones and your family members. And not even just those who are living right now, but you can also pay for the sins of those who have already passed away. So if you're concerned about your Aunt Sally and what she might have done while she was here on earth, you can go ahead and pay enough money to make sure that you'll get to see her in the kingdom of heaven. Again, this was a pretty good deal for those who were wealthy, those who could afford to do this. But for the poor, it was an incredible injustice. And it was raising funds in this way that helped to fund building many of these basilicas and cathedrals that we went to see. As I was stepping back and thinking about all that we saw and experienced along the way, what we kept seeing and hearing over and over again is that as the church became focused on money, as the church became focused on power and politics and prestige, the church began to lose its way the church began to become broken and got off track of what it was originally intended to be, what God's intentional will was. But then after we visited some of those, we would go to places like Assisi. And while we were in Assisi, we got to learn all about St. Francis as we visited his basilica. And while we were there learning about St. Francis, we learned about this man who was so humble, who denounced all of his earthly possessions, who committed to a life of poverty, and help call the church back on track. Help to remind us that our first intention, our first commitment, is to love and to serve one another. And though at times God's intentions get broken by sin, by poor choices. But in the midst of those circumstances of brokenness and corruption and, and greed, in the midst of those circumstances, we can still find God's will for us going forward that calls us back to live in a spirit of love and service for our neighbors. Well, there's so much that we have to learn from our past, so much that we have to learn from history, that we can live out God's will here on earth, just as God lives it out in the kingdom of heaven. So how do we find God's will? I believe it's by growing in our faith by spending time growing in our relationship with God so that we can grow near to God's heart and understand God's intentions for the world. When we start our day with daily devotional time, listening for God's voice speaking to us, when we spend time constantly in prayer, connecting with God, when we spend time searching the scriptures and studying together in small groups and on our own, 
when we make it a priority to come together to worship as a family of faith so that we can experience the gift of God's grace. All of these things help us to to grow in our relationship with God so that we can know God more deeply, so that we can begin to understand God's intentions for our lives and for our worlds, so that God's will might be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. Dads, we have an incredible privilege and responsibility to be able to show our children what it looks like to be growing in our faith. We have an incredible opportunity and privilege to model for them growing in our faith so that we might be able to discern God's will in whatever circumstances we find ourselves in in life so that we can begin to live out that will in order to reveal God here and now through the gift of love. So second, we make that statement, thy kingdom come. I believe that God's kingdom is shown through our acts of love. When we allow God to work through us to bring his love into the world, we help to bring glimpses of God's kingdom here and now. You know, sometimes in theology, when we start talking about God's kingdom or God's ultimate will, we use this phrase, the already but not yet. What we mean by that is that through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we have already seen a glimpse of God's kingdom. But we know that it's not yet complete. We know that God's ultimate will isn't yet fulfilled because we simply look around our world and we still see brokenness. We see war and violence. We see hunger and injustice. We know that God's ultimate will hasn't been fulfilled yet, but we know that we've already seen glimpses of it through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. When we participate with what God is doing in this world, we help to bring glimpses of that kingdom here on earth. We help to participate in what God is already doing in the lives of others. We have an opportunity to make a difference. You know, whenever you read through the Gospels, Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God constantly. And oftentimes as Jesus is talking about the kingdom, he's talking about it in conjunction with eating together. It's at the Last Supper that Jesus is there sharing a meal with his disciples. And and he tells them there that he won't again eat the bread or drink the fruit of the cup until he's with them in the kingdom of God. He tells parables about the kingdom of God in in which he, he talks about it and compares it to a great wedding feast or a great banquet. Now oftentimes Jesus is talking about the kingdom And it's all related to eating with one another. I think there's something important, something special that happens when we share a meal with one another, when we break bread together. There's love that is shown there. There's something special and spiritual that unites us together in sharing a meal. That's why we come together around holidays and we often eat together. We come around special celebrations and birthdays and we often share a meal together. Because there's something special that reveals a love through sharing a meal. Well, while we were on our trip, before we went to Oberammergau to see the Passion Play, we stopped at a, a little small town called Etal. At Etal, there's an abbey there that's still run by monks today, and they have a school there. They have this beautiful church that's there. But before we went into the church, we took time to stop out in the courtyard, and we all gathered together as a group. And it was Reverend Wendy Lambert who led us through Holy Communion. It was such a special moment. Before we were to go and witness this passion play, remembering the love of Christ for us, we took time to celebrate the Last Supper, Holy Communion, together. And Wendy reminded us that at the Last Supper, Jesus shared with his disciples, he took two common, everyday, ordinary items, bread and wine. Two things that they would have had at nearly every meal that they ate in that day. And he used these two common things to tell them, Every time you eat this bread, every time you drink from the cup, remember me. Remember the gift of my love for you. So we came together that day to use those two ordinary things, bread and the fruit of the cup, to be reminded of the gift of God's love in our lives and the calling that we now have as people of faith to share that love with the world. Because we know that there's something that happens whenever we do that, that helps to reveal glimpses of God's kingdom here and now. We get to participate with Christ in bringing God's kingdom to earth. You know, recently I I read a story this last week, a story that you may have seen. It's about a a woman named Ashley Wilkerson and her father, Tony Geddes. 
Turned out that Ashley was driving her father home one day from his cancer treatments out in North Carolina. He was there at the Duke Cancer Center, and, and he had progressed quite a bit in his cancer diagnosis to a point where that whenever they were leaving the hospital that day, he had been incredibly weakened by the treatments. He could barely sit up in the front seat of the car. In the back seat were Ashley's mother and her two young daughters. They were driving down the highway going back home when all of a sudden Ashley looked up in her rearview mirror and she saw a sight that none of us like to see, the red and blue lights flashing. She pulled the car over and, and she immediately started to feel her heart racing a little bit faster. She could feel her anxiety rising. You see, Ashley and her family are black. And too often they've seen images and videos on news of people who look just like them getting pulled over for what were supposed to be routine traffic stops that ended in tragedy. Now, Ashley said she knew you can't judge a whole group by the actions of a couple of people, but she said, I still just couldn't help but feel this anxiety rising, my heart rate getting faster. As the officer approached the car, her father gathered what strength he had, and he, he kind of rose himself up, and he rolled down his window. He flagged the officer over and he began to immediately explain, sir, this is my daughter here, and she's driving me home from my cancer treatments. She's simply trying to take care of me. Don't punish her for this. He immediately was coming to his daughter's defense. The officer looked inside the car, and he saw this family there. He began to use his skills to evaluate the situation. He knew what it looked like to have a loving father defending his daughter, because he too was a father who had a young daughter. He looked down in the car and he saw that there was a bag attached to Tony's stomach. He knew what that meant. He asked for her license and registration and he walked back to his car. He sat back there for what seemed like an eternity. Ashley said that she could start to feel her heart rate rising again and starting to wonder what's taking so long. This is taking longer than it should. The officer was back there in his car and he was not only evaluating her information, but he was reflecting and evaluating on his own life. See, she didn't know it at the time, but his name was Officer Jarrett Doty. And Officer Jarrett Doty was sitting back there in his car as he was thinking about his own experience that it had been not too long before that, that he had been diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. He'd gone to the hospital and had to have a procedure done. The doctors had told him that if he had let it go much further, that he would have had colon cancer. He remembered as he was going through with that how much it meant to him to have family and friends and his church family around him praying for him offering strength and support and love. And he had made the commitment that as often as he could, he wanted to be able to share that love with others. So he sat there in his car thinking about that commitment that he had made. He knew that he wasn't going to write her a ticket, but he was trying to think about what else he could do to help them. He got out of his car and he walked back over to the, the passenger side window. He handed the license and registration information back to her. And he turned to Tony and he said, what kind of cancer do you have? He said, it's colon cancer. And in that moment, Sergeant Doty knew what he had to do. And he turned to him and he said, would it be all right if I pray with you? Well, Tony was a man of faith, a man who believes in the power of prayer. He's very active in his church, a leader in his church. So he said, absolutely, I would appreciate that. So Sergeant Doty took his hand and the two men began to pray together. Ashley said that she was so taken aback by the moment that she took out her phone and she silently snapped a picture of it to be able to remember this moment. And it was back in late March that that happened. Sergeant Doty, after he was done praying, he pressed something into the hand of Tony and he wished them well and walked back to his car and he drove off. It was a couple months later, on May the 22nd, that Tony lost his fight with cancer. He passed away. It was a few weeks later that Ashley was reminiscing and thinking about her father's life and her love for her, and she remembered that day. She had never shared that story with anybody else, but she decided that day to make a post on Facebook. And she posted this picture that she had taken of this officer praying with her father. She didn't even know the officer's name. But she posted this picture, and, and she told the story of how, she, of how he had prayed with her father in that moment of need, the kindness and the love that he had shown to them from a complete stranger. She told the story of how her father, even in his weakened condition, had shown her love by raising up to defend her. It was such a powerful moment and such a powerful story. It didn't take long before the story started to go viral. People were sharing it all across the country. It was getting thousands of likes and comments and, 
and people sharing it with others. It didn't take long before this story was shared with the North Carolina State Troopers Office. They recognized the officer, Officer Jarrett Doty. They were able to get in touch with him and they connected him with Ashley. And the two of them got to visit and it was up until that point that Officer Doty said he didn't know what had happened to Tony, didn't know how the story had turned out. He was being interviewed about this and he said, this really isn't about me. This is about a father who loves his daughter, a father who lost his life. This is about a daughter who lost her father, somebody who was, she was so committed to and loved so much. But he said, I'm so grateful to have this picture now. He said, in all my years as a state trooper, I've pulled many people over and I've prayed for so many of them, but I've never prayed with any of them. This is the first and only time I've done that. He said, it really was a special, a holy moment. And I'll always cherish having this picture now to remember it. They were asking Ashley about it, and she said that she too was grateful for this picture because it reminded her of the kindness and love of a stranger. But it wasn't just the picture that she had to remember that day. Remember that item that Officer Doty pressed into her father's hand? It was a small silver metal cross. She has it sitting now on her dresser table. Somewhere where she'll see it every single day. And she said as she walks by and she sees that silver cross every morning and every evening, it reminds her of the kindness and the love that a stranger had shown to them. It reminds her of the love that her father had always shown to her. And she said that cross reminds her of the gift of the love of her heavenly father. When you and I choose to live out of a spirit of love, when we choose to show kindness and love towards our neighbors, we participate in what God is doing in the world to reveal glimpses of his kingdom here and now. Dads, we have an incredible blessing, an incredible privilege, and an incredible opportunity to model for our children what it looks like to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ to grow deeper in our faith so that we might be able to discern God's will for our lives and for our world. We have an incredible opportunity and to privilege to model for them what it looks like to love our neighbors and to love God with all of our heart. We know that we can pray these words with confidence. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We can pray these words with confidence knowing that it's not just a wish list that we offer to God, but it's our whole heart, our entire lives that we're offering to, to God so that our hearts might be changed and transformed to be able to carry out God's will here on earth, to bring glimpses of God's kingdom to the world around us. We can pray these words with confidence because we know that it's the prayer he taught us. It's in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite each of us to lift up our own silent prayers. Amen.
Today is a great day to join our family of faith. And if you have been thinking about uh, joining St. Luke's, I want to invite you to come forward during this next song if you're here in person. If you're watching online, I hope that you would text the word JOIN to 405-351-4001 or go to our website. Uh, we would love to welcome you to our family of faith. During this song, I also want to invite the members of the Youth Force uh, team who, is, or who are heading out, and if you'll come forward so that we can uh, pray over you and invite Reverend Randy Crownover to join me uh, along with Logan Fish, our Director of Hospitality. Would you please stand for our closing song? for just a moment. Let's stand up here. I want you all to get a good look at some of those who are going on the Youth Force trip. Uh, there's a group of almost 35 people, youth and adults, who will uh, be at the different services today, and they are headed out to Ardmore, Oklahoma, and they are helping to repair houses, and they're going to do that this week, and typically, I don't want to uh, speak it into existence, but typically it ends up being rather hot in Ardmore, Oklahoma. <laughs> and uh, how many of you have been on a youth force trip before? Okay, some of you have experienced the heat, but all of them are giving this uh, time and they're giving a week up. It's not all fun. Although doing things together and doing things that make a difference uh, brings fun into it. And so we're so proud of you guys. We're proud of all of you. We know that you're going to have a great time. We know that you're going to make a big difference. And so I'm going to ask if you would just kneel here so that we all can pray over you for just a moment. Would you pray with me, please? Almighty God, we pray over this Youth Force team we pray that you would protect them and guide them. We hope that everything they do makes a difference in the life of others and that you would help to bring change into the Ardmore community because the youth and the adults of St. Luke's are there to share your love and bring hope. We pray that they would draw, be drawn closer to you and one another, that they would have a great time and they would understand how important the work they do is. Lord, we love you and we love these youth and these adults who have committed themselves to this time. We ask that you would hold them in your hand and uh, help them throughout this trip and bring them home safely to us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Would you give them just a, a hand and thank them? going to sit back down and I just want to ask you to stand for the sending forth. 
And I hope that you would be praying for the Youth Force team. Uh, the names of all of the participants are in your bulletins. Take your bulletins with you. I know some of you are very, very good at recycling. Don't recycle today. Uh, take the names, or you can recycle the inserts if you've read all those announcements. Take the bulletin with you so that you can remember all of this team in your prayers. Uh, you are our hands and feet, and you are our re representatives. Most importantly, you're God's representatives. So we're proud of you. We're going to be praying for you all week long. Next Sunday, Dr. Long is back and will be leading us in the continuation of the sermon series. And so I hope that you'll be here to hear his message and his reflections on the trip that we just took. And so please receive uh, the sending forth. Go in peace, knowing the love of Christ that unites us all and calls us to trust in God's will so that we all can make an impact in this world. Through Christ our Lord, amen. We love you. Have a beautiful Sunday. Happy Father's Day. Go get a pop for your pops out in the lobby. Thank you for joining us online. Praise Him for the wonders of His love. Praise God. Praise God. From whom all So love.